Good morning, church family, both here and online. Uh, it is awesome uh, to see your faces. Uh, I, I just feel compelled to tell you guys this morning, I love you. Uh, it's sweet to see you. Uh, it's hard uh, with the distancing that we've, we're all experiencing, and, and uh, to see your faces and to see your praise is sweet. So uh, praise God for that. Uh, a couple announcements before we dive into God's Word together. Uh, first of all, I do want to uh, remind you, urge you, press you, beat you into submission. Please uh, register every week for the service that you're coming to. Um, we do have a self-imposed uh, cap of 125 in each service. <laughs> uh, so obviously no one's counted uh, yet. So uh, we need you to do that, please. We really are trying to spread out the numbers in our services um, for a, a, few, a few different reasons. One for safety, but also just so that each service would have a meaningful gathering. If you've only got 25 people in a room and 200 in another, that's a little tough. So some of you, we would ask you to consider moving over to the third service. And so that we don't blow it out, you know what you can do is you can register for it and then you'll know, see how that works. So we want you to do that, please. Uh, I beg of you to do that. Some of you, please consider um, shifting either to the first or to the third as well. Uh, secondly, if you'll take out your bulletins in the center, the whole center section reminds us that we have our 10th annual Christian Thought Forum uh, coming up. This is an apologetics conference um, that we started here, obviously 10 years ago. Uh, thrilled uh, to be able to host it again this year. It is going to be different. It's going to be semi-live is what we're calling it. Uh, our speakers' messages will be pre-recorded. We'll have a live gathering here where we'll hear those, and then we'll do a live feed with each speaker after the message so that we can have our typical Q&A time with them. So if you want to come to that, you're going to have to register early. 125 people again is what we have. So it's, it's uh, $10 in person. $15 in person, $10 online. We'll also stream it so you can view it at home. Uh, I hope I've captured everything there. The two speakers we've got, Greg Kokel, who's been here before, president of Stand, um, Stand to Reason Ministries, and uh, he's going to be speaking on finding the will of God. Uh, the other speaker is Sam Alberry, great guy with a great British accent. Uh, and I love uh, how he carries himself in a very precarious uh, position that he occupies. He identifies as a same-sex attracted male. He is in the pastorate, but he practices a celibate life because he does not find that same-sex attraction to be practiced, to be consistent with the Christian faith. He has something to say to the church and to the world, and his tone is wonderful, and I'm glad to have both of these speakers, um, and so I hope you'll participate uh, with us in our 10th annual Christian Thought Forum. With that, would you bow with me in prayer, and we'll ask for God's help to dive into his word. Father, this morning, I thank you not just for the timelessness of your word, but for the timeliness of your word, that what is here revealed by your spirit and preserved for us in written form does not just describe days gone by, but the days in which we live. We ask, God, that you would speak to us now by your spirit, through your word. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, if you take out your Bibles and open to Isaiah 1, uh, that's where we're going to be this morning. Isaiah 1 is like a microcosm of the book. So this is a critical one to hear and to take in. Uh, this might come as a little bit of a surprise to you. Um, I'm a dog person. I am not so much a cat person. Rumors gotten out about that. And um, we've had a few dogs over the years, and some of them have even been good dogs. Um, but even with my stated preference for dogs, there have been moments where I would like to kill my own dog. And I suspect that some of you could relate to me. Uh, when we lived back in Yakima, Washington, we had a yellow Labrador there. His name was Potter, not for the Harry Potter, but for Colonel Potter of the MASH era. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Many of you don't. So this was Potter, and he loved to play Frisbee. So we would take him to Franklin Park, and I would love throwing the Frisbee with him, and he would chase after it, and he would do it until his gums were bleeding because he would just go after that Frisbee like crazy. But then there would come a point in time 
where I would throw one maybe a little too far or something, something would change. And he would go out to the end of where this frisbee is and he would sort of stop. And he would like look at the rest of the park. Like, wow, there are other things to do here. And then he would kind of look back at me and it was like he had this realization, I'm out of your reach. You can't get me. And he'd kind of look at the park again and he'd put his nose to the air. And I, when he put his nose to the air, that dog was gone. It was like he went, barbecue. And then off he would go. And so I would chase out. I mean, even before he'd start running, I'd be like, don't you do it. Don't go. But he would. And he'd take off just running through the park in a mad dash of freedom. And um, I would be chasing after him with my blood just boiling in anger. You know, like, get over here. I'll kill you. And that never seemed to work to bring him back to me when I said that. Finally, I would get him, get him back into my truck and slam the door, and I'd yell at him the whole way home, all right? Never taking you to the park again. Your Frisbee days, over. That is the memory, that moment of exasperation that came to mind when I'm reading through this particular text here. And this, we hear the exasperated tone in God's voice over his wandering children. Isaiah 1.1, 1, 1, the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth. For the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manager, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Uh, this particular passage here in these, in these intro, introductory verses, God takes Israel to court, so to speak. Our passage is like the scene of a courtroom and God is the prosecuting attorney laying out his charges. He is indicting his covenant people. Uh, this type of scripture or this uh, motif is known as a reeve motif, spelled R-I-B, reeve motif. Again, it's like a courtroom drama. If you like courtroom TV, this is courtroom scripture. This is God bringing uh, his charges against his people. Uh, there are other books in prophecy that have this same kind of tone. Hosea, Amos, Micah, similar language, and they are contemporaries um, of Isaiah as well. And here in verse 2, in sort of poetic fashion, God calls witnesses to this case. And the witnesses here are heaven and earth. It's, it's as though he's saying, all of the world knows what I'm telling you here is true. It is seen and known everywhere. And so these Opening verses here, two and three, we get, we get the, the charges, God's charges, his complaints against his people. And the first is, my people don't know me. Uh, I want to pause here quickly and just recognize that this is written during the time of the divided kingdom. So you have Israel, uh, northern, is the northern kingdom with its, uh, with its capital, Samaria, and Judah, the southern kingdom, with its capital, Jerusalem. What we find here in the scriptures, though, is that sometimes the term Israel is, is used with some fluidity by God. Sometimes he's referring to all his people. Sometimes he's referring to the northern people. Sometimes he's referring specifically to Judah, but calling them by the name Israel. So just recognize there's some fluidity here. But the bulk of the, of the message of Isaiah is to Judah. That's his primary audience. So just kind of keep that mind as we're going here. But in this case, the insinuation of his message, you are acting in a manner lower than most of the animals. Even critters know their master's voice. But you are running completely away from me. The second complaint is the uncorrectability of God's people. Look at verse 5. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities burned with fire. Your fields are 
being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. So the imagery morphs here. We move from the imagery of sort of master and animal to exasperated parent imagery, which I'm sure is something many of you can relate to right now as you're a lot of you educating your kids at home or have more of your kids at home than you're accustomed to. Uh, I ran across uh, this meme uh, recently here uh, that kind of made me laugh. I thought it was funny, so I brought it. You lied. My kids are not a joy to have in class. I like that one. We get this same tone almost of exasperated parent, which was introduced in verse 1, getting developed here in verses 5 through 9. It's this, it's so God is saying, hey, I've reared these children. They've rebelled, and, it's, and he, he expresses it like, I've tried everything. I tried parenting with love and logic, boundaries, time out, counting to three, Grounding, natural consequences, taking away your cell phone, extra chores, removal of privileges, and I'm getting nothing from you. I'm getting no change, no contrition, no repentance. You're persisting in rebellion, and no amount of discipline or consequence will turn you around. Even though life is beating you up from head to toe, you're a hot mess. And even the wounds that have come about because of your own decisions still don't change your actions. And so we're left feeling God's angst here. What do I have to do? What do I have to do to turn your heart? The scriptures use a lot of different images to express God's heart for his people. We use uh, sort of the master animal imagery. We see the exasperated parent imagery here. Uh, In other places, God is presented as the jealous husband Not an insecure husband who is overbearing and always questioning about his wife, but a a husband who is rightfully jealous for his bride's affection. Uh, And we see that actually in the prophet Hosea. Uh, Hosea was a contemporary of Isaiah. Uh, Interesting, I think Hosea had a more difficult job. Isaiah was supposed to sort of deliver the word of the Lord and confront. That's tough enough. But Hosea was supposed to live it out. The instruction given to him was that he was supposed to take an adulterous wife and rebellious children, and he was supposed to live out and dramatize Israel's waywardness from God. How do you even go about that? You know, you're looking for a bride. Okay, this is what this is going to look like. You walk up to a woman. Well, you look particularly promiscuous. How about if we get hitched? I think you'll play the part perfectly. How does, that, how does that go? That's a tough gig. And so Isaiah and the prophets use many images and metaphors to convey God's angst and his longing for his people. In fact, Isaiah is known as the Shakespeare of the Old Testament because he uses so much imagery here. Notice something about the wounds here, though. For the most part, it seems like they're self-inflicted. There are the inevitable consequences of the rebels' flight from God. Uh, this past week, we had an elders' meeting Tuesday night, and uh, it was a late one. I think I got home about 10.30, closer to a, close to 11. And um, I got home, and Huckleberry, our chocolate lab, sitting at the door, wants to go out. So I let him out. And that turkey, supposed to come immediately back, uh, reminded me of my old dog, Potter, and he took off. And I'm absolutely ready to go to bed and tired, and he's not coming back, and he's not coming back, and I can't go to the door and scream in the middle of the night, Huckleberry, right? So I'm laying on the couch, waiting, waiting, waiting until I hear him. 1.30 in the morning, he comes back, (laughs) wet, because it was drizzling, cold, shaking, maybe fear, uh, (laughs) and his gut just swollen full of what I believe to be the neighbor's compost pile. 
And I looked at him and I thought, you're the perfect picture of what I'm studying this week. <laughs> Just this wandering, defiant animal, runaway kid, bruised, battered, cut, wet, hungry, tired, because you've been running headlong into your own destruction because of your own evil desires. And here we see, I think, one of the great principles of Scripture, which is this, that God only commands good things. The corollary to it is that God only restricts destructive things. And I think the steady wrestling of our faith is, do we really believe that? You might look at it in your finances. You sit down to do your taxes and you go, these are too high. I think I'll just fudge the numbers a little bit so I can get the refund I want. I just won't report this little bit or I'll report it differently. I don't like the way the government spends my money anyways. Never mind that Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. I'm gonna give to Eric what is Eric's. Very tempting. Or another way we might do this is, how big a deal is sexual purity? Sounds like an archaic thing to me. It sounds like an old puritanical value. I know what I want. I know how to get it. I think I know better than God how to be happy. I think oftentimes we feel that the commands of God, the restrictions of God, are really God withholding some good that we would really like to have for ourselves. Surely we know better. Adam and Eve are examples of this as they listen to the serpent's voice. Did God really say? No, God's holding back something good. So they saw the fruit, they took it, they ate it, and they plunged the world into sin. Or think of Israel on the way to the promised land. Okay, God's commanded us to go here. He's giving us this. Oh, that looks hard. That's tough. I remember when we were slaves back in Egypt and we had what? Do you remember this? Pots of meat. That makes me laugh. We had pots of meat. Never mind the slavery. That wasn't so bad. We had pots of meat. Okay. Should have taken some beef jerky along the way. God only commands good things. He only prohibits that which will destroy us. But we see here that the wounds are not only self-inflicted, some of them, some of them are, just, are not just consequences of rebellion. It seems to me at times that they are actually dispensed by the Lord himself. That there seems to be an agency. It, it's not explicit here, but it seems to me that there's more than just natural consequences coming here. And here I think we see another great principle of Scripture, which is that God disciplines those he loves. Hebrews 12, 5. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Well, we move to sort of the third complaint here. And what's interesting about this is that God sort of embarks on a little bit of name calling. Some divine name calling. So if you're looking for a biblical precedent to do that in your own home, here you go. Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord. You rulers of Sodom, listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Wait a minute, has Isaiah changed his audience here? For those of you who know your biblical history, you know that Sodom and Gomorrah were cities in the time of Abraham that were known for their rampant sexual immorality, especially homosexual practice. And their practice was such an affront to God, something he condemns in his word that he destroyed them in spite of Abraham's protest and prayers. God destroyed the cities for their pervasive and callous and steady sin against him. And here, God is calling Judah, his covenant people, by their name. He is indicting them on their sin. It is a way of identifying their sin and placing it on a similar level of offense and showing that they are on a similar precipice of judgment. Uh, kind of like... This name calling is like calling your son Nancy when he can't get the pickle jar open, you know, straining away. Come on, Nancy, let's get it going. None of you would do that, of course. 
But here, God is calling his covenant people, hey, Sodom, hey, Gomorrah. This is what's coming your way if you don't turn it around. And so that is a shocking and a bit of name calling here. And I think an implication for this, for those of you who tend to think that homosexual practice is the ultimate sin, the biggest sin, the big one, well, uh, it would seem by this kind of name calling identification here that Judas in a fake religion is right there on the same level and inviting the same kind of judgment for God. They're masking their fake faith as though it were real faith. And hypocrisy is something that God absolutely condemns. We find this too in the New Testament. Grace and mercy and forgiveness were offered by Jesus for those who were truly repentant of sin, especially and even those who were caught up in sexual sin. But the sanctimonious religious elite parading around in their own self-righteousness, they drew the white hot wrath of Jesus. Look at the description we find here of Judah's sins. They're sort of laid out for us. And you can see right here that at the heart of it is a hollow faith, a hollow show of religion, but no true heart. Verse 11, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, they cannot bear your worthless assemblies, your new moon feasts, and your appointed festivals. I hate with all my being. I'm not aware of stronger language in the the Old Testament. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. So here, here we see just an enumeration of God's offenses. The plaintiff lays down charge after charge after charge. And thankfully, he gets on with some prescription too. And the prescription is on one level pretty simple. Uh, quit doing the wrong thing and start doing the right thing. This prescription is so simple, even Spike Lee got it, right? With his title, do the right thing. In other words... Let your weekend worship be also reflected in your midweek behavior. And in verse 17, we actually get a concrete list of what doing right looks like. Four things are named there. Seek justice, defend the oppressed, step in for the fatherless, I'm paraphrasing there, advocate for the widow. And I would say to you, Christian, this is one of the places of real pride in our faith and the way that it calls us to love our fellow man. In other words, to truly love God, one has to love neighbor. The two are inseparable. I like the way that poet Richard Wilbur has articulated it in a title to one of his poems. He says, love calls us to the things of this world. In other words, the church is not simply here for itself. The church is here for the world. In the New Testament, we find Jesus teaching this same kind of truth. It's presented as the golden rule. It appears in classrooms across America. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And Jesus' teaching is actually an improvement over the previous rule known as or what we call the silver rule an ethical teaching prior to Christ, which basically said, don't do to others what you wouldn't have them do to you. It's basically a rule of do no harm. But the golden rule in the teaching of Christ is to go over and above that, to actively engage in love, to love and to do what you would have done to you. It's superior to the preceding ethic. 
And I thought, I want to get right down to brass tacks on this. There's four things listed, and I think there's four ways that we can be about what God is instructing Israel to do here in our own community. Um, there are four ministries. I've listed them on the back of your notes. Their web pages are right there. Three, uh, all of them are local, although one has its impact internationally. The first one is the Find Out Now Free Pregnancy Center. So if you want to talk about stepping in for the fatherless, here's a place for you to do that. Um, unfortunately, I think the voice of the church when it comes to uh, the pro-life position is a lot less than pro-life. Well, they will see the church with signs picketing the sidewalk, begging uh, someone not to have an abortion and to bring this baby into the world, which we hope and we long for. But their position is, ends up being less than pro-life. They end up being just pro-fetus. We not want only that baby to be born, but we want that baby and that mom to find the support that she needs to do this hard thing and bring a baby that was unexpected into the world. We need to be pro-life, which means getting behind that woman and saying, we got your back. And this pregnancy center does that, and there are ways you can be a part of it. Another way you can help out is the food bank. This is a ministry we've partnered with. We've been helping out a lot. And uh, there is more food insecurity right now in our community than in typical times. And uh, we can help by our donations and we can help by our service. Safe Families is a new ministry uh, that we've adopted. And uh, we're still kind of in the up and going stages of this. This ministry basically says there are families that are in a point of crisis where maybe the kids uh, don't have a good uh, safety and support network in the home. And so it basically gives some short-term housing or support for a family that's in a bit of crisis. It's a way of preventing these things from uh, going to some of the governmental sources here in town. The church can step in and take care of the community first. And then finally, another one here is MTN, Meet the Needy. This is almost a 20-year-old ministry now of Bethel Church, which is amazing. About 170 Ethiopian children in Addis Ababa that you can support with 35 bucks a month. I think there's, there's usually about five to 10 uh, that are looking for someone to sponsor them. And I don't know the exact number now, but I know there's still some. And we just signed up again. These are four ways you can let your faith show up in the streets and not just exist in the four walls of a sanctuary. That's what's offensive to God. Judah preening around in worship while ignoring the needs of the, of the streets. This particular pretension is exhausting to God. So the steps to be taken here, quit doing what's wrong, start doing what's right. I think one of the things, I think King David is a great example of this. He bears the moniker, a man after God's own heart, which is a little bit amazing when you think about uh, his sins. You go, whoa, those were big ones, right? And yet, I think what made David a man after God's own heart was that when confronted and convicted, he was quick to repentance. And so church, I want to ask you a question where you're sitting. What sin do you need to confess? What forgiveness do you need to lay hold of? What is the Holy Spirit of God naming in you that you need to address? And my encouragement would be address it this week. Stop doing wrong. Start doing right. I think of AA's mantra, we are only as sick as our secrets. And that might be a secular proverb, but it's nonetheless true. What we hold back from confession, we feed and nourish so that that sin can exist in the shadows. Dr. Rosaria Butterfield has likened that to keeping a little baby pet dragon. And the problem with baby dragons is they grow up. John Owen has, the Puritan John Owen has a great saying along this too, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. So we move kind of from this shocking bit of name calling here from God. Hey, Sodom. Hey, Gomorrah. And we move from there to this invitation to repentance and we're given hope. Our God is one who forgives. He forgives. Verse 18. 
Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. These are some of the most colorful pictures in all of the scripture. Describing both the stain of sin and yet also the completeness of God's forgiveness. And what we see here is that the way back to God is not through religious shows, but through real heart repentance. Uh, I would say the word repentance is a tough word in our culture. It's a little bit tough for me. I think it needs to almost be redeemed and sanitized a little bit because where we run into the word repentance around us, again, it's typically on a sandwich board or a sign accosting us at an intersection while we're just waiting for the light to turn green. But what we find, I think, in Scripture is this, that God's call to repentance is a gift. It is a wonderful thing. I do appreciate the change in the language from the uh, 1987 version of the NIV to the 2011 version. Uh, I grew up on the 1987 version, probably like many of you. That's when I think of Scripture, that's what I hear. Those are the, that particular cadence of words. But in the 1987 version, this passage said, come, let us reason together. I'm sorry, that's a little soft. It's beautiful, but it's a little bit like we're being invited over for tea or haggling over a price on a used car. Well, let's, let's reason together. This is an improvement. No, let's settle the matter. In other words, there's no haggling. There's no reasoning. There's no negotiating with God. There is only our debt of sin. And yet, the wonderful possibility of repentance and in, uh, forgiveness through repentance, an invitation to dive into that. And so that beautiful seed of hope is planted right here, gospel hope right here in Isaiah. The way of restoration is through real repentance, not just lip service. And real repentance begins with a broken and a contrite heart. And it shows up in a changed behavior. Uh, I also think forgiveness can be a tough word for us. Uh, it can be tough for me to accept it or to fully grasp it. Uh, partly because I, I, mean, I have difficulty thinking of the completeness of God's forgiveness because forgiveness as we typically run into it is with other humans. Human forgiveness is so much inferior to the forgiveness we find in God and it can trip us up a little bit. Even where human forgiveness is offered and accepted, we usually find some kind of continued relational strain Things are changed. The forgiveness of man is incomplete, imperfect, partial, thin, conditional, incremental. But God's forgiveness is not like that. His forgiveness of our sin is complete, full, finished, final, because it's anchored in the finished work of Christ. I think sometimes it can be more helpful to speak of forgiveness not in relational terms because, again, that's complicated, being humans and all. I think sometimes it can be helpful to think of it in economic terms because, well, money is a little more tangible. Um, a number of years ago, uh, our family had kind of an incident in the house. I was outside mowing the lawn, and my wife was inside in the family room. Aiden was in the living room. And he was sitting on the couch, and he was drawing, and just, I don't know, sitting on the couch drawing for a little while. And uh, my wife uh, heard a loud bang, kind of a thud, and didn't think too much of it, because we've got kids. There's thuds in our house, right? That happens. Uh, we have a new rule now that we investigate thuds. This is why. A few minutes later, minutes later, Aiden comes walking into the room, holding some of his teeth and bleeding from his face. And what had happened was, after just, we think, after sitting there so long, he just stood up and he passed out and fell right on his face. And he broke his jaw. And it was awful. We were at the emergency room and he was in pain and was bleeding and little shards of teeth in his hand. It was just ugly. Uh, and we, 
the next day went over to the oral surgeon's office and we were told that they needed to wire his jaw shut and the way to do that was you've got to pay $15,000 now and then we'll do the procedure. So you guys got kids? Make sure you got 15K sitting there ready to go. We're kind of like, what? So we get things going and, um, and a few weeks later, uh, I was supposed to, we were t- using Samaritan Ministries um, uh, health, uh, not insurance, but the health co-op, whatever you want to call it. That was our medical coverage. And one of the things they ask you to do is if you have an incident, you're supposed to go uh, to the provider and say, I'm a cash payer. Is there a discount available for a cash payer? It's just one of the steps you go through. So I did that, met with the business office, told them we have this coverage, but we're cash payers. Is there any discount? When we went to our next appointment, there was an envelope and the provider had completely refunded the entire charge. The whole thing. He didn't discount it. He forgave it. He, he took it all away. It was not charged to us or anyone. He absolved it himself. This is what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. His forgiveness is full. It's complete. It's final. It's absorbed and absolved in Jesus. The command to forgive, the call to repentance is an incredible gift that God gives to us. He loves to forgive. He longs to forgive you of your sin. Approach it. Last point we see here, we see the risk of continued rebellion. And in comparison to the forgiveness available to us, why would we do anything else? Verse 6, see how the faithful city has become a prostitute. She once was full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all have bribes, chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. Now, I want you to notice something here important about these verses, not just for our message this morning, but for the message of Isaiah in general, and that is this, that the sin of Judah presented is not always something that they've done, but very often it's something they've failed to do. In other words, there are sins of commission and there are sins of omission. Um, In the Book of Common Prayer, this is not something that's typically a part of our liturgy or our worship here. But there is a wonderful confession um, in this book that I wanted to read for you. It goes like this. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. That is a good confession and it recognizes that there are different ways of sinning. Sins of commission, sins of omission. And that is important for us to grasp. There are ways in which we have sinned, not because we've doled out wounds, but because we have failed to nurse the wounds of others. I think the temptation for many of us is to stand back and go, I'm not a bad guy. I'm not a bad gal. I'm certainly not as bad as the person sitting next to me. You should see what they do. But our omissions of love and our apathy toward justice are sins in God's sight. For all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Therefore the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the mighty one of Israel declares, Ah, I will vent my wrath on my foes and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. I will restore your leaders as in days of old, your rulers as at the beginning. Afterward, you will be called city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be delivered with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness. But rebels and sinners will both be broken, and those who forsake the Lord will perish. 
You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become tender and his work a spark. Both will burn together with no one to quench the fire. Verses 24 through 31 are admittedly difficult to untangle because what's weaved together here is promises of wrath and restoration, adversity and refinement. And so there's this mixture here that seems tough to reconcile. So I'm going to turn to Tim Keller, who can untangle this better than I can, and we'll close by hearing these words. One of the main questions constantly raised by the historical books of the Bible has to do with the nature of the covenant. Is the covenant conditional or unconditional? Will God say that it is conditional? Because you broke the covenant, I will cut you off, curse you, and abandon you forever. Or will God say that it is unconditional? Though you have rejected me, I will never wholly abandon you, but will remain with you. This mystery is one of the main tensions that drives the dramatic action. Since people have forsaken him, will he forsake them? There seems to be no easy answer that will not compromise something we know of God. Will his holiness give way to his love so that he overlooks sin? Or will his love be overwhelmed by his holiness so that the divine hammer falls? And then Jesus comes, and we hear him crying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we realize the answer. Is the covenant between God and his people conditional or unconditional? Yes and yes. Jesus came and fulfilled the conditions so God could love us unconditionally. That is good news, and it's right here in Isaiah. Let's pray. Our Father, as we look at this book, as we look at this opening chapter, we find the gospel arc right here. You are holy, high, and lifted up. You delighted to make us and to make us for yourself. We are sinners. We have run and wandered. And you will not tolerate it. But you made a provision in your son, Jesus Christ, that he might be filled up with our sin, that it would be killed in him that we might be forgiven and stand forever with you. What great hope we have in the gospel. Thank you for telling it to us as early on as even in this book of Isaiah. We praise your name, or it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.